Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Uh, this is Cherry Kvoda at the Ohio State University. Um, this is the September monthly September cafe, um, uh, indoor ag science cafe. Again, this is a, a sort of communication platform and learning platform about indoor farming. Um, uh, this whole um, series are uh, supported by a project called Optimia, funded by USDA uh, NIFA program. All right, so let's start. Um, so um, we have a new Q&A page in the archive page. So after the, you know, listening to this um, cafe, and if you have questions, just go in there and then type the questions. And then I get notified and then I can contact speaker and then have the uh, answers to your questions. So that's an additional way to be interactive um, with, with us. All right. Um, so uh, conference information, um, Japan Factory, uh, no, Japan Plant Factory Association is doing a, a online training program and then usually two day, three day program, but they expanded the duration. And then um, I think accessible for that time. Um, I'm also participating in one of the Q and A um, of their training program. So that's something if you need a, a additional training opportunities for your workers, or if you're new to this um, area, that might be interesting. And then also they are doing quite interesting surveys. Uh, one is for finding productivity or benchmark of productivity of indoor farms. The other one is a more like a terminology perception uh, characterization of indoor farm. So I, I thought it's interesting. And then I'm going to send this link so you don't need to write up um, the link information, but I, I'm going to send out the link so that you can um, uh, take a look and decide whether it is uh, something you might um, find interesting. So that's also Japan Plant Factory Association. All right, so the cafe series uh, today, um, we have Dan Gillespie from JR uh, Peters um, talking about uh, basics of hydroponic uh, nutrient management. And then the next month, October, we will have Dr. Sanya Idik, um, who, is, um, who is going to talk about hydroponic food safety. So more um, science-based details, I guess, um, she, she's gonna share, excuse me, she's gonna share in October. In November, we are communicating uh, with one of the project members, Dr. Murakachira, because he has a quite interesting um, outcome. So I'm, I'm hoping he can um, take that spot in November. So if you have a request, you know, uh, we have a, a basic series and we have a science series. So if you have a request, you know, what kind of information you wanna listen to or learn, that could be great. All right, so today um, I'm gonna stop this here and then have uh, Dan as a speaker um, about the hydroponic nutrient management basic. Cool. All right, um, and you can see my screen, Dr. Kubota? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Um, so thank you, Dr. Kubota. So as Dr. Kubota mentioned, my name is Dan Gillespie. I am a technical specialist at J.R. Peters, and I uh, just want to thank everyone for being here today for your attention. Uh, I'm really big fan of this webinar series, so I'm honored to be speaking here today. So just a brief background on myself. As I mentioned, I'm Dan Gillespie. I am currently a technical specialist at J.R. Peters. Um, but some background on myself, um, I was first introduced to controlled environments and hydroponics and actually introduced to Dr. Kubota at the University of Arizona, where I study controlled environment agriculture at the Control Environment Center um, at the university there. So that's kind of where I um, found this uh, love for hydroponics and controlled environments. So it was there from 2013 to 2017 after finishing up my bachelor's degree. At Arizona, I took a job in Brooklyn, New York with a company called Farm Shelf, uh, which is a great company. I got some really great experience and got to work with some really great people. Uh, so Farm Shelf is located in New York City, um, and they manufacture and build hydroponic systems for restaurants and consumers to grow their own produce. So a uh, really cool company and got some really great experience there. 
um, but decided that I wanted to go back to school and get my uh, master's degree. So linked back up with Dr. Kubota at Ohio State in 2018 through 2019 and did my master's in horticulture and crop science where I studied under Dr. Kubota and uh, my research focused on hydroponic leafy green production. Specifically, I was looking at how pH affected nutrient uptake, plant growth, and uh, ultimately disease incidence. After finishing at Ohio State um, about a year ago uh, to this month, actually, I took a job at J.R. Peters. So J.R. Peters, um, just very quick background, has been around for quite some time. So the company was started by Bob Peters in 1947 after he returned from World War II. And Bob Peters actually started out um, analyzing local greenhouses and local growers, water, um, their plant tissue, and their grow media, and actually providing nutritional analysis on uh, these parameters, and then providing recommendations to growers on what that analysis showed. Um, eventually, some of these growers started to request that Bob start to mix some of this fertilizer he's providing and put it all into one bag, and uh, that's actually how we became a fertilizer manufacturer. So today we are both a nutritional lab and a fertilizer manufacturer. Um, both the manufacturing facility and our nutritional lab is located in our headquarters in Allentown, Pennsylvania. So not too far outside of Philadelphia. Um, but yeah, so again, today a fertilizer manufacturer in addition to a nutritional lab. So today, before we dive in here, just briefly, what um, I wanna to discuss today is hydroponic systems and nutrient solution. Before we start moving into creating a nutrient solution and developing a nutritional program, and then we'll move into some additional considerations and components of a nutrient solution before we finish up with some common issues and then solutions to these issues. So within hydroponics, the way um, I kind of like to look at this or kind of break it up is into two different types of production systems. Uh, so within hydroponics, we have our liquid culture hydroponic systems, which is probably more the traditional type of hydroponics when you think of when you hear that word. Um, these include things like NFT systems or nutrient film technique, deep water culture systems, ebb and flow or aeroponic systems. This is typically how leafy greens, herbs and spices are going to be produced in a commercial hydroponic situation. And really what this is classified as, so the plant roots in these liquid culture systems will actually be growing directly into the nutrient solution. So we can see that in this bottom picture here, the plant roots are suspended and then they're just gonna be growing directly into that nutrient solution. Alternatively, we have soilless culture. This is typically how fruiting crops like tomatoes, cucumbers, uh, peppers, eggplant, uh, strawberries are going to be grown in a controlled environment um, uh, production situation. And these systems are characterized by the use of a grow media or some type of substrate. This may be cocoa core, peat, perlite. There's many different types of grow medias or substrates that can be used, but these soilless culture systems, the roots will actually grow into this grow media. And then the nutrient solution will be applied either by a drip stake, like a top feed system, but basically these are constant liquid feed type systems, meaning that every time the plant receives water, it's also uh, being provided fertilizer or food as well. So in both of these systems, whether it's a liquid culture or a soilless culture system, water soluble fertilizer is going to be supplied on a constant basis in the form of a nutrient solution. So we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, but even within these liquid culture and soilless culture systems, we may have an open or a closed system. So in an open system, that's gonna be characterized where a nutrient solution is drained to waste after it's delivered to the plants. Whereas a closed system, some people may refer to this as a recirculating system, the nutrient solution is going to be captured and reused in this type of system. Open systems, relatively speaking, are going to be a little bit simpler to manage than a closed system. In a closed system, we may start to see some nutrients begin to accumulate over time, whereas other nutrients may begin to deplete over time. 
this is going to uh, basically nutrient imbalances are going to begin to occur as some nutrients begin to accumulate and deplete. And these nutrient imbalances can sometimes become a little bit more difficult to manage. So in an open system, we always want to consider our EC, our sodium and chloride concentrations of our source water, but it is going to be less of a concern in an open system where everything is being drained to waste and it's not being reused. Whereas in a closed system, we're constantly capturing this uh, nutrient solution or this water, and we're going to be reusing it. So our EC, sodium and chloride concentration are going to become uh, much more of a, a larger factor and they must be more closely looked at and, and more considered when using these types of systems. And we're gonna speak more about that later, but just for now, I just wanna kind of make note that uh, in a closed system, these EC sodium and chloride concentrations are, are a big component and must be highly considered. So getting back to our nutrient solution. So in controlled environment agriculture, if we're even using a grow media, this grow media is going to provide little to no nutrients. Thus, we need to provide our nutrients in the form of a complete mineral nutrient solution. So water, excuse me, water soluble fertilizer salts are going to be used to create this nutrient solution that's going to supply the plants all of the nutrients. Jack's Nutrients or J.R. Peters fertilizers are one form of these premix fertilizer salts. And these are going to be formulated fertilizers to create a nutrient solution and really to provide plants with all the essential elements. So again, the grow media, if we're even using a grow media, it's going to provide little nutritional value. So we need to ensure that we're providing all the essential elements for plant growth through our nutrient solution. So what are the essential elements that we need to provide through the nutrient solution? Well, of course, we need to provide our macronutrients. The primary ones, the big ones, the ones you see, the three numbers on the fertilizer are going to be nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. We also have our secondary macronutrients, calcium, magnesium, sulfur. And then our micronutrients, iron, manganese, zinc, copper, boron, molybdenum, and chloride. And then we have some essential nutrients that uh, are essential for plant growth, but are not going to be provided by the nutrient solution. And that would be carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So when we're creating a nutrient solution and a nutrient program, there's a couple things we really need to consider and take into account. Typically, or where I, we like to start at J.R. Peters and the, kind of how I like to think about building a nutrition program is it all kind of starts with our source water. So the question here we want to ask is, does our source water contain any free nutrients such as calcium, magnesium, or is there anything in our source water that could inhibit plant growth such as sodium and in some instances chloride? Next, we need to begin to consider our crop species and we need to ask the question, what are the nutritional requirements of the crops that we're going to be growing? Within our crop species, we have different growth stages, of course. So how do the nutritional requirements of the crop change throughout the growth stage? And how many different uh, nutrient solution recipes do we need? Typically, you'll have a propagation and vegetative stage, and then you might have a reproductive phase as well, depending on the crop species that you'll be growing. So by taking these considerations into account, we can begin to select fertilizer formulas or fertilizer salts to create our nutrient solution and begin to build out our nutrition program. So let's kind of dive into each of these considerations a little bit more in depth here. So as I mentioned, it, it really kind of starts with our source water. Source water analysis in controlled environment ag and especially in hydroponic crop production, it's critical in selecting a fertilizer formula and creating a nutrition program. So a detailed analysis of our source water, it's gonna let us know what we're starting with. Basically our pH of our, of our source water, the alkalinity, the nutrition profile. So some source waters may have, you know, uh, lots of calcium and magnesium in there to begin with. Um, whereas other source waters may have some harmful ions present such as sodium and chloride. So this is all very critical information when we're starting to think about um, which fertilizers are we gonna be using? Are we gonna need any filtration to our water to help purify or clean our water? Um, so equipped with this data, we can start to see, again, what nutrients are there, what nutrients are not there, and we can start to begin to manage these imbalances through our nutrient additions or through our fertilizer formula selection. 
Um, we do at our nutritional laboratory offer source water samples. So if this is, you know, something that you need to get going at your facility or operation, we do have the capacity to do this at our nutritional lab. So once we take a look at our source water, we know what we're starting with, we know the nutrition profile of our water, we need to start thinking about our crop species. What crops are we going to be growing and what are the nutritional requirements of this crop? So each species of crop obviously is going to have slightly different nutritional requirements, but we can bucket these crops into different groups to a certain extent. So we have our leafy crops, herbs and spices. And within that group, we have our heavy feeders, you know, typically spinach, cilantro, pak choy, certain cultivars of lettuce, kale and Swiss chard are going to be some of the heavy feeders in that leafy crop group. And then you'll have light feeders, you know, other cultivars of lettuce, excuse me, your microgreens are a fairly light feeder, basil and parsley. But then you also have your fruiting crops, which are typically, you know, characterized by heavy feeders such as tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, eggplants, and in some cases hops. But then even within this fruiting crop group, you have things like strawberries and maybe some other berries that are kind of on that light feeder, salt sensitive side of the uh, nutrition requirement spectrum. So we develop, you know, we take a look at our source water, we can see what's in there. We start to think about our crops, nutritional requirements, and then we have to start to think about the growth stage. So do the nutritional requirements of our crop change throughout the growth stage? And if they do, how much do they change? Do we need different nutrient solution recipes for each of these growth stages? These are things we, we need to start to think about at this point of developing our nutrition program. So typically, almost all crops are going to have this propagation stage. The goal of this stage is obviously to as quickly establish an extensive and strong root growth that can state or uh, that can sustain the lush vegetative growth we're looking for in the next stage. So as I mentioned, almost all crops are going to be used or are going to have some form of a propagation stage nutrient solution nutrient uh, recipe. In addition, almost all crops are going to have this vegetative growth period as well. The goal here, we want to push a vigorous shoot and root growth. So it's typically characterized by high nitrogen levels. And for crops like leafy greens and herbs, they're going to be harvested in this vegetative state. So we can kind of end the growth states discussion for leafy greens and herbs at this growth stage because we're not uh, going anywhere past this vegetative state. Alternatively, for things like fruiting crops, tomatoes, strawberries, cucumbers, we need to start to consider reproductive growth because we want to start to push heavy and high quality flower and fruit production. So vegetative growth requirements or nutrition requirements are typically a little bit different than a reproductive growth requirement. So for crops like tomatoes and cucumbers, you may have upwards of three to four different nutrient solution recipes. And as we move into this reproductive growth phase, we're typically increasing our phosphorus and potassium levels. And as I mentioned, you know, something like a leafy crop may just have a propagation of vegetative growth recipe, but a tomato or cucumber may have a propagation of vegetative and then maybe one or two uh, recipes for its reproductive growth here. So um, we need to really consider how do nutritional requirements change uh, throughout a cropping cycle and what are the goals that we're looking to get out of our crops here. So once we start to consider all of these considerations or take all these considerations into account, we can start to put the, all this together. So once we've determined what's in our source water, the quality of our source water, the type of hydroponic system we're going to be using, and the nutritional requirements for a crop at each particular growth stage, we can now start to select fertilizer formulas to build out a nutritional program. So how, if, if you don't know this type of information, how, how can you, you know, gather uh, this information and develop a nutrition program? Well, this is something that we can help out with. Um, we've developed crop specific nutrient targets. We can help with lab analysis, interpretation, and we can help select fertilizers and uh, help build out nutrition programs for your facilities. Um, so here at J.R. Peters and at Jax, we really wanna ensure that our customers are getting the most out of our fertilizers. Um, so this is something that we do in working with growers and helping develop nutrition programs. So if this is something that um, you would like to discuss further, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. So 
with that, we've kind of discussed how uh, we should begin thinking about developing a nutrient solution and building out a nutrition program for our crops. Um, specifically, we want to hit our nutrient targets at this point here. But once we build out our nutrient solution and we have our nutrition program, there are some other components of a nutrient solution that we need to consider and we need to take into account and we need to monitor to ensure um, optimum plant health and nutrition and in the end goal, optimum yields and plant growth. So and these are electroconductivity, pH, dissolved oxygen and temperature. So electroconductivity, we'll start there. This is gonna provide information on the general fertility level of a nutrient solution and whether salinity problems are likely to exist. So the EC is basically gonna tell us the ability of a solution to conduct electricity, it's basically gonna give us a read on the overall salt concentration. It is not gonna tell us the individual ion concentration. So it's not gonna tell us uh, the concentration of nitrogen, the concentration of potassium in our solution. It's just going to kind of give us an overall picture. It's not going to really kind of dial in on that individual ion concentration. So to determine the individual ion concentration, that will require a lab analysis. But nevertheless, this electroconductivity does provide valuable information and should be something that's uh, pretty closely monitored within your nutrient solution. It's gonna be measured typically deci siemens per meter or milli siemens per centimeter. And the typical nutrient solution is gonna be anywhere from 1.0 to 2.5. Again, this is really gonna depend on the type of crop, the growth stage, um, and then even maybe the hydroponic system that you're using. So moving on to pH. pH is a measure of the hydrogen ion concentration of a solution. This is a unitless measurement. Typically for most crops grown in controlled environments, we're going to target a pH of about 5.8 to 6.0 with a range of 5.5 to 6.5 being um, typically acceptable. Again, this is generally speaking for most crops that we're growing in controlled environments. Typically, uh, most source waters will have a pH that is slightly above this range, maybe uh, kind of neutral around 7.0. So in most cases, we are going to need to lower our pH to this optimum range. Uh, we're going to do this by a use of an acid. There's several different types of acids that can be employed, such as sulfuric acid, nitric acid, phosphoric acid, or um, citric acid. Um, at Jax or J.R. Peters, we do offer a citric acid product. Um, and then alternatively, this is a little bit less common, but it still you know, needs to be done in some cases, is to raise your pH to this range. Um, so this is done using a base. Um, one product that we offer to do this is potassium bicarbonate. Um, and the nice thing about potassium bicarbonate, it can actually add some alkalinity or add some buffering capacity back to your water. So for people who are using RO water or rain water or any type of source water that's very low uh, alkalinity, um, when you have those types of source waters that have low alkalinity, you may see um, uh, a lot of swings or a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, I guess a lot of swings in your pH. So. Um, adding some potassium bicarbonate, again, it's going to add some alkalinity, can help stabilize the pH of these low alkalinity waters. Um, but then it's also going to raise your pH in addition to that as well. Um, one thing that we need to keep in mind when we're adding an acid and a base is that in most cases, these are going to provide some nutrients. So for example, nitric acid is going to provide nitrogen. So we need to start to take this into account when we're building our nutrient solution uh, because we need to uh, keep in mind of nutrient ratios and nutrient imbalances. Um, so this is something that needs to be accounted for when we're selecting acid and then adding an acid or base to the nutrient solution. The amount of acid or base to adjust our pH uh, to get to this optimum range, it's really going to depend on the makeup of our water and it's mainly going to be dictated by the source water starting pH as well as the alkalinity. 
Um, one really great tool is I have this link here and I, I, I know this presentation will be shared, but uh, this was a tool, it's called AlCalc, developed I believe by the University of New Hampshire. Um, and if you know your, P, uh, your source water's pH and your alkalinity, um, you can actually select from a couple different acid options and it will actually calculate the amount of acid you need to uh, lower your pH to a specified uh, target pH. So um, that is a really great tool for kind of getting an idea of how much acid you may need to add to your water to get to your target range. So uh, pH is very dynamic. It's a very important factor of our nutrient solution. The pH is gonna affect much more, um, you know, it, it's gonna affect many different components of our nutrient solution and as well as our fertilizer salts and their solubility. So it's gonna affect the forms of available ions that may be present in our nutrient solution. As I just mentioned, it's gonna affect the solubility of our fertilizer salts. It's also gonna affect individual ion uptake. In addition, nutrient uptake can actually affect the pH of a nutrient solution as well. So cation or positively charged ion uptake is typically gonna cause our pH to decrease. An anion or negatively charged ion uptake is going to cause, uh, in most cases, an increase in pH. And we can demonstrate that here. So here we're looking at our plant root, and we'll demonstrate this with the use of ammonium. So ammonium is not uh, the preferred form of nitrogen that's used in hydroponic systems, um, but in, nevertheless, it will be used in some small amounts in some instances. Um, but when we think about ammonium, it's a positively charged ion here. So this is a cation. So as the plant root is gonna uptake this positively charged cation, it needs to balance the charge there. So it's gonna extrude this hydrogen ion. When it extrudes this hydrogen ion to the nutrient solution, that's going to cause our pH to decrease. So fertilizers that are high in ammonium, you will typically see uh, this uh, associated with a decreasing pH. Alternatively, we have nitrate, which is a negatively charged ion or an anion, and this is going to, in most cases, cause the opposite effect. So here we're seeing the plant root uptake this nitrate ion, this negatively charged ion. To balance the charge, it's going to extrude the OH- or the HCO3, which is going to cause our pH to increase. So most hydroponic fertilizers in hydroponic nutrient solutions, the primary form of nitrogen uh, that is used is going to be the nit this nitrate form. And uh, almost all of our Jack's nutrients formulas that are designed for hydroponic use are gonna be uh, primarily nitrate based here. Um, so typically nitrate is going to cause the pH to increase. However, that's not always the case. In some cases, nitrate uptake, it may bring a cation with it, such as potassium in this example. And in that case, there's no need, the, the charge is kind of already balanced there. So in this case, the pH will stay stable. So typically nitrate is gonna cause the pH to increase, but in some of the cases like this example shown here, we could see our pH staying stable. Um, root respiration will also impact the nutrient solution pH, and this is typically going to lower our pH. So in root respiration, the plant is taking up oxygen here, and it's going to form carbonic acid, which is in turn going to lower our pH. So this is just to demonstrate really how uh, dynamic pH is and how nutrient uh, uptake can impact your pH. Um, and it's something, you know, that should be understood. And uh, as you monitor your pH of your nutrient solution, you will see uh, these things start to occur. So um, it allows you to get a better understanding of why this is occurring in your nutrient solution. The last component um, I want to touch on is dissolved oxygen and temperature. So dissolved oxygen and temperature are important in liquid culture systems. Um, not to say that they aren't important in soilless culture systems, but when the plant roots are growing directly into a nutrient solution as they are in a liquid culture system, um, it's a little bit more uh, crucial to play uh, or to pay a little bit more attention, attention to these uh, components. Um, but dissolved oxygen, it's a, a measure of the presence of free oxygen molecules in the water. It's going to be measured in milligrams per liter or parts per million. Ideally, the nutrient solution dissolved oxygen should be above six parts per million. 
Um, as we start to see dissolved oxygen levels drop below this range, we start to see plant growth decline. Uh, but really, the, the threat of disease or disease, the likelihood of disease incidence really starts to increase as dissolved oxygen decreases. Um, temperature is, again, important in a liquid culture when the plant roots are really kind of sitting directly in that nutrient solution. Um, and temperature and dissolved oxygen are related. So the potential for water to hold dissolved oxygen decreases as temperature increases. So colder water is going to hold more dissolved oxygen than warmer water would. Um, again, we kind of have this optimum temperature range. This is going to be, again, this is just a generalization for most crops. Um, but temperature is one of those things that's it's fairly difficult to control and it may be quite expensive to control. Um, but uh, outside of this range, again, you may start to see the likelihood of disease incidents begin to occur. So with that, we've kind of discussed developing our nutrient solution and our nutrition program. Some of the components of our nutrient solution that we need to monitor and consider. Um, so I wanna move on to some common issues and challenges that are pretty prevalent in the industry and um, hopefully provide some solutions that may be helpful. So just briefly to touch on the types of nutrient disorders and how they're characterized. Um, so we have mobile nutrients, which can be translocated from old or lower leaves. So a mobile nutrient deficiency, excuse me, is going to appear in the older lower leaves first. Alternatively, we have immobile nutrients. These are nutrients that cannot be translocated from older leaves. So these deficiencies are going to appear in the young new growth first, so the, the, the newer leaves. Um, so this is uh, a very valuable knowing and being able to make the distinction between mobile and immobile nutrients when you're looking to diagnose nutrient disorders. So um, it is uh, very valuable to know the differences between these types of nutrient disorders um, to be able to uh, effectively diagnose nutrient deficiencies and kind of get an idea of what nutrient deficiency we may be dealing with. So by knowing our mobile and immobile nutrients, we see that we can identify which nutrients are mobile and which nutrients are immobile, as you see on this slide here. Um, one nutrient that I wanna make note of is one of these immobile nutrients. The first one here is calcium. Um, so just remember calcium is an immobile nutrient immobile nutrient means we're going to see that deficiency occur first on the young and new growth first. And uh, we're going to speak more about calcium in a little bit here, but just kind of keep that in mind as you see that on the new growth first. So nutrient disorders, nutrient disorders are not always going to be caused by an insufficient supply of nutrients. Nutrient disorders can also be induced by environmental factors, the pH of the nutrient solution, nutrient imbalances of the nutrient solution, and several other factors as well. But this is something I think uh, that it's commonly misunderstood is it's, you know, even if you have uh, a sufficient supply of nutrients in the nutrient solution, you can still um, occur or you can still see nutrient disorders occur. And one uh, great example of a nutrient disorder induced by mainly the environment is tip burn. So what is tip burn? Um, this is probably the most classic example of a nutrient disorder that is not caused by an insufficient supply of nutrients. So tip burn is a calcium deficiency. And as I mentioned, this is not caused by an insufficient supply of calcium in most cases. Adding more calcium to the nutrient solution will not alleviate this problem. It may actually cause further problems by creating nutrient imbalances and causing antagonistic effects. So as we see in this picture here, tip burn is the browning of the edges or the tips of the leaves. It's often seen when the plant's growing too fast. And as we spoke about, calcium is an immobile nutrient. So this is going to occur on the new young leaves or basically where the growing point or the meristem of the plant is. 
And this issue, it's mainly going to occur in head lettuce or other species that display a similar morphology to head lettuce. So basically um, a type of morphology where the growing tip or the meristem becomes enclosed by the older, uh, larger leaves. So why does tip burn occur? So tip burn occurs when the leaves are going to be growing at a faster rate then calcium can be translocated to these growing points or to the growing tip, to this new young growth. So to understand why this occurs, we have to think about how calcium travels through the plant. So calcium travels through the plant with water. So as head lettuce grows, the growing point becomes enclosed within the older, larger leaves. As we see in this picture here, this blue arrow is pointing to our growing tip and we see these older, larger leaves really start to kind of enclose that growing tip. So when those older, larger leaves are enclosing that growing tip there, we begin to see very little transpiration at that growing tip. And that's because it's creating a very humid microclimate, it's increasing the boundary layer. So we're just seeing very little transpiration at that growing tip, again, because those older leaves are creating that humid microclimate. When we have little to no transpiration, that means little to no water or calcium is going to be translocated to this area. So we need to start to think about how are we going to increase the transpiration rate to this area, thus increasing the amount of water or calcium that can be translocated to this area. So one very effective method of increasing the transpiration rate at this growing tip is by applying vertical airflow and this is done typically with vertical airflow fans. So by applying the vertical airflow, we're you know, really providing the airflow to that growing tip. So we're starting to break up that boundary layer, increase the transpiration in that humid microclimate. When we increase the transpiration right there, we're increasing the amount of water and calcium that is being translocated to that growing tip, thus alleviating some of that tip burn uh, disorder that we're dealing with. So this vertical airflow is, is probably the most effective strategy, at least uh, at, to this point that I'm aware of, to really kind of alleviate tip burn um, symptomology. There are some other tip burn prevention strategies. Um, again, they don't seem to be as effective as the vertical airflow technique, but still I think they're worth noting. Um, one is increasing your uh, nighttime humidity to uh, ranges above 95% humidity. Um, this is basically dealing with root pressure. So you're basically kind of trying to force the water and the calcium up into the plant. Um, however, with this, you do run the risk of increasing disease pressure for diseases that thrive in high humid environments like powdery mildews and things like that. Another strategy, not very ideal, is reducing your growth rate. Um, so reducing the daily light integral to kind of slow down plant growth to allow calcium to be moved to that growing tip so the leaves aren't growing as fast so the calcium can be supplied there. Um, so if you're in a greenhouse, this would mean shading your greenhouse um, in an indoor setting, uh, reducing your light intensity. Again, not the most ideal strategy because you're um, kind of, you know, cutting back the, the, the goal of the, the fast production in these, in these control environments. Um, and then lastly, one thing that can, uh, is really actually quite important is cultivar selection. Um, so selecting tip burn resistant cultivars can go a long way um, in kind of reducing tip burn incidents. So just to summarize this tip burn, we kind of just went through a lot there. So I just kind of wanted to bring it back home and make sure um, everything there I just spoke about is clear. So when we have calcium traveling through the plant with water, that's basically, we need to understand how calcium moves through the plant. In a head lettuce or anything that displays that type of morphology, the young growth becomes enclosed by the older leaves. This is gonna create a humid microclimate. Within this humid microclimate, we're experiencing little to no transpiration at this growing point here. That means little to no water or calcium is being supplied to the growing point, which is going to result in tip burn. So our best solution here is increasing the transpiration rate at the growing point by applying vertical airflow. 
Here, uh, this is just some pictures of some vertical airflow fans employed in lettuce greenhouses, just to kind of show you what it might look like in a production facility. So with that, um, I wanted to move on to some closed system challenges, um, some challenges that many growers experience in recirculating systems. Um, so I'm going to speak about EC, sodium, and chloride, and then um, refilling a recirculating system as well. So I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation that in a closed system, you really need to um, consider the EC of your source water and the sodium and chloride concentration of your source water. So a high EC or high sodium and chloride concentration can inhibit plant growth. Um, the level or the, the threshold for these values is going to be species specific. Um, so different species will have different salt tolerances. Um, for example, tomato, very salt tolerant plant can be grown in very high ECs um, with uh, little inhibition to its growth. Um, alternatively, you have a crop like strawberry, which is very salt sensitive type crop. So very species specific response. Nevertheless, in a closed system, you want to be paying close attention to these parameters. So in a closed system, if your source water contains sodium and chloride, particular high levels of sodium and chloride, uh, these nutrients are really, or these ions, uh, I shouldn't say nutrients, uh, but ions, um, are not really going to be taken up by the plant in um, excessive amounts. So in a closed system where we're constantly recirculating our solution, the sodium and chloride ions can begin to accumulate over time. As these ions begin to accumulate, this can lead to a high EC. A high EC can induce a salt stress response in a plant, which is basically going to induce uh, similar to a drought stress response, which in turn, is, it's going to inhibit plant growth. In addition, the sodium and chloride ions can also cause antagonistic effects, so they could compete with other ions for nutrient uptake. Um, so in a closed system, we really need to consider if our source water contains sodium and chloride, um, how are we going to deal with this? So what are some ways we can deal with this? If our source water does contain high levels of sodium and chloride, and we wanna employ a recirculating or a closed hydroponic system, we may need to take some precautionary steps. So the first thing we can do and the most ideal thing would to be used or to find a different water source. Uh, this may be reverse osmosis water or rainwater, um, but if we can find, a, if our source water does contain a high EC or high sodium and chloride, we may wanna consider finding a more, a more pure source of water. Um, some operations may not have the capacity to go to 100% different water source. In this case, it may be beneficial to even just blend your source water with a mere, more pure source. Um, for example, maybe a 50% RO water or 50% city water uh, blend will help dilute some of these harmful ions. Um, so ideally, we're either using a more pure source or blending the source water with the high sodium and chloride with a more pure source to help dilute some of this out. If we don't have the capacity to use a different source or to blend with a, uh, a more pure source, we're going to need to consider bleeding our reservoir, which is basically draining our solution and replacing with some fresh water to help dilute some of these harmful ions to lower levels. However, with this method, we can start to create nutrient imbalances, right? So if we're just draining some solution and topping off with some fresh water, um, this may start to cause nutrient imbalances over time. So ideally, really in a, in a closed or recirculating hydroponic system, we want our EC, our sodium, and our chloride concentration to be as low as we can get them um, to avoid some of these issues that come along with these, uh, these ions, when we're, especially when we're growing in these recirculating systems. So another issue or another challenge um, that I see quite often with recirculating systems is how do we refill our recirculating system? 
Um, so many facilities or many systems uh, or recirculating systems may monitor the EC and add nutrient solution to maintain a specified EC target. So this is a good short-term strategy. Um, however, it can start to create nutrient imbalances over time. Um, so as we spoke about uh, when we touched on EC, is EC will kind of give us uh, an overall representation of the, the salt levels within a solution. It's not going to tell us the individual ion concentration. So even though we're maintaining a target EC, we may see some nutrients accumulate while other nutrients are going to deplete. So as I just mentioned, EC is not going to tell us which nutrients are accumulating and which nutrients are depleting. So although our EC may be maintained at our set point, this does not necessarily mean our nutrient concentration targets are going to be maintained. So our EC set point may be 2.0 and our nitrogen concentration target may be 200 parts per million nitrogen in our solution. So even though our EC is being maintained at 2.0 or being maintained at 2.0, excuse me, that does not necessarily mean we're maintaining 200 parts per million of nitrogen. So this is something that you know really needs to be considered and I think it uh, should really be understood within this industry is EC is a valuable um, measurement, but it's not gonna tell us which nutrients are in there specifically. So how do we kind of combat this? Um, one solution that not necessarily ideal in terms of sustainability would just to be drain and replace your recirculating solution every 14 days or so. So that would mean draining your system completely, starting with a completely fresh nutrient solution just to ensure um, uh, the turnover, ensure our nutrient targets are where they need to be. Um, a little bit more accurate way of doing it where you don't have to drain and replace your solution would be laboratory analysis every one to two weeks of your nutrient solution. This is going to tell you what nutrients are accumulating, what nutrients are depleting, and then you may be able to adjust your nutrient recipe based on what you're seeing in that lab analysis. Um, Dr. Neil Matson from Cornell um, has an awesome lecture um, about specifically adjusting your nutrient solution based on a lab analysis here. Um, goes through a whole case study and everything um, on how to do this. Um, so this is a great resource and it is available on YouTube. Um, one thing with the laboratory analysis and making adjustments every one to two weeks is it can be quite laborious and it can be a little bit difficult in some instances. Um, so a lot of growers are looking for a premix fertilizer that they may be able to use for a recirculating solution. Um, and one thing that I've been doing a lot of thinking about and would really like to kind of start to investigate further is can we develop a fertilizer formula to account for typical nutrient accumulations and depletions in a recirculating system? So can we you know, identify what nutrients accumulate, what nutrients deplete? Can we identify trends? Can we identify factors that are affecting this accumulation and depletion? With the end goal to be, can we develop a fertilizer formula that is really designed to top off or to refill a recirculating hydroponic system? Uh, so this is something that I've kind of been doing a lot of thinking about lately um, and really kind of wanted to work on. Um, so if anyone else is maybe interested in working on this or has any thoughts or input on a refill formula for uh, closed hydroponic systems, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, I think this could be something that would be valuable to this industry is a pre-mixed formula that accounts for a typical accumulation and depletion in recirculating hydroponics. So with that, just to wrap up here and to summarize everything, um, we, talk, we started by talking about developing a nutrient solution, a nutrient program. To do so, we need to determine our source water quality, our crops nutrition requirements, the type of hydroponic system that we're gonna be using. From there, we can begin to select fertilizer formulas to develop and to build our nutrient program. 
We also spoke about uh, once we have our nutrient solution, there's certain components such as electrical conductivity, pH, dissolved oxygen, and temperature that should be considered and closely monitored to ensure optimum plant health and optimum plant growth. And then lastly, we learned that nutrient disorders can be caused by an insufficient or excessive supply of nutrients, but nutrient disorders can also be caused by the environment, pH, nutrient imbalances within solution as well. And just quickly before I wrap up, some things that we are currently working on at J.R. Peters is, and some new formulas. Uh, we're currently working on a strawberry formula. Um, we'll be working with Dr. Kubota a little bit on this, um, but the goal here is to develop a formula with a low feed and nitrogen rate while still maintaining micronutrient targets. We're also working on a new leafy green uh, formula as well. Um, similar to some of our formulas that we currently have, but a little bit lower in phosphorus. Um, and then as I mentioned, uh, hopefully can maybe start working on a refill formula for recirculating systems as well. So as I said, if um, anyone has any input or um, would like to discuss that refill formula more, please don't hesitate to reach out. So with that, that's all I have. Um, again, I want to thank Dr. Kubota for having me and thank you everyone for joining and thank you for taking the time and thank you for your attention. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions at this time.